Excellent. So more people may join as we are talking, but uh, we've got a good number to start with. And as I've said, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you today to our webinar uh, from the Good Business Charter on embedding responsible business behaviour. Now, I'm just going to start with a few slides. There may be people here who are not GBC accredited. So I'm just going to start with a very brief um, summary of what we are and, and then really go in to talk about the importance of embedding and, and why we're using this particular word. So let me share my screen with you. So embedding responsible business behavior. The Good Business Charter has 10 components, as I'm sure you'll be aware. And these are pretty all encompassing. We have five around employees, a real living wage, fairer hours and contracts, employee well-being, employee representation, and equality, diversity, and inclusion. We then have our environmental responsibility as organizations, the importance of paying our fair tax, commitment to customers, ethical sourcing, and prompt payment to suppliers. Now, by its very nature, when someone applies to a credit with the Good Business Charter, they have to go through and answer specific a new one for me you never know what's coming your way do you um so anyway i was saying that by its very nature when you come to a credit to the good business charter there are specific questions asked are you doing this um and and that is an important aspect of what we do however what we've really been aware of over the last two to three years is the importance of it you know really isn't about yeah we do all this ticket shelve it and forget about it. I'm sure you've all had policies you've worked on and then everyone forgets about it. But the reality is that we have really come to appreciate the importance of embedding the Good Business Charter. So what do we mean by that? So there's a real difference between receiving Good Business Charter accreditation and then embedding it through your organization, really taking those 10 components and assessing what you're doing around each of the 10 and working it through the organization. And it's worth saying at this point, there's also a real difference between one person in the organization knowing about the Good Business Charter and making sure that, yeah, that you're able to meet all of our components at the point of accreditation and the whole organization knowing about it and embracing it. We really have seen that it's a framework to help you establish the way you're going to move forward responsibly. It's not just a ah deep breath that we've achieved these 10, we can sit back and relax. No, it's a framework because the vast majority of these are a journey, as I'm sure you're all aware. Some are a fairly yes or no. So do you pay the real living wage? Though even with that, each year, you obviously need to be aware of what it uplifts to and make sure the uplift with it. Do you, pay, do you pay your supplies properly? So those are our two, the first and the tenth, that, that can tend to be a little bit more yes, no. But everything else, what about your employee wellbeing? Where are you going on that journey? What are you doing? What about ethical sourcing? What's the next step? How can you push yourself? So we've, we really want to encourage all of our accredited organisations to appreciate that this is a framework to help you establish not just what you do now, but the way you move forward responsibly. And there's a really great opportunity to communicate that framework internally to your colleagues who want to work for a responsible business. That's what they want to do. And externally to customers and other stakeholders who want to know that they are supporting, supplying, purchasing from a responsible business. So it's not just we're saying you ought to do that. I mean, there's two really key reasons why we ask you to communicate it. One is actually to help us pick up organizations that are not telling the truth. So if an organization says that you know their employees have a voice and they're being paid the real living wage and then they tell everyone about the good business charter and the employees are like that's not true then they can come and talk to us about it and they can raise the alarm. But also because as you communicate the framework and use it in that way you start to really push yourself to Go further, do better, hear from your colleagues about different ways that you can um, do even more to behave responsibly. So it really is um, something that will bring benefit to yourself as you communicate that. 
I want to just whip through some practical examples of what that looks like. But as I said, I'm keen to get on to Natalie and Katie, who will be able to share how they've done it in their own organisations. But some of these will be more relevant to different organisations than others, but it just gives you a flavour of what we're talking about. So it's ensuring employees have a meaningful way, a meaningful way to raise both suggestions and concerns. That could be a forum, regular one-to-one -one meetings, perhaps a suggestion box, perhaps all of those. But but really, I want to emphasize the meaningful. Are, do employees really feel like they're going to get heard when they bring their suggestions forward? There's a lot of software out there now that helps measure employee well-being. Uh, depending on your side, you could look at some simple ways to check in with colleagues, or you can look at implementing software where people just say how they're doing. I was reading about some of these wristbands the other day that in the construction sector, which measure uh, stuff, uh, kind of morale, I guess, and how they're doing. But there is a lot of different things out there that you could look at. Involve your colleagues in assessing the full environmental impact of your activities. You know, they probably have some really innovative ways that they've seen in other organisations, particularly perhaps if they've come from another organisation. What have they seen done there? Work together to, to look at how we minimise our environmental impact and care for the planet. Not only does it bring lots of great ideas your way, but it just helps validate what you're doing and helps your employees realise, actually, as an organisation, we really care about this and we want to do more. If ethical sourcing was an area that was relatively new for you, it might be more for service industries that haven't necessarily thought about it so much in the past. Start by looking at your biggest supplier. Ask them about their ethical practices. And if you're not comfortable with their level of compliance on basic human rights, move the supplier or at least look at what we can do. The more pressure we put on some of these big suppliers, uh, the more that they're gonna think we need to clean up our own acts and look at our own ways of behaving towards our workforce uh, and, uh, and, and environment. Publish a clear commitment to your customers on your website. You'll know this is one of our specific questions and deal swiftly, woo, deal swiftly with complaints, addressing them and making improvements for future customers. You don't forget to use your website to explain your commitment to our principles more generally, really using that space to explain what you are passionate about and what you're committed to. That's what customers want to hear, uh, but also knowing that their particular issues will be dealt with swiftly. That's not to say that responsible businesses and good businesses will never have a disgruntled customer. Of course they will, uh, but it's how we deal with those issues. Another five for you. So form a responsible business group in your organisation that meets monthly or quarterly, whatever works in your organisation, to assess what else you can do and keep issues on the agenda. If we've got something coming on the agenda on a regular basis, or you've got particular people from across your organisation meeting together, it's just going to help drive that through the sort of, through the arteries of, of the business, really, as everyone thinks about how to behave responsibly. Consider allowing flexible working opportunities from day one for all colleagues. Uh, ensure even those working their initial operation are receiving a real living wage. It's just making sure no one's falling through the, the cracks on these things and that everyone feels uh, valued and included within the workplace. Assess your recruitment practices for quality, diversity and inclusion. Have you checked recently that they are using inclusive images and language? Do they include flexible working to make sure that you're making it as wide a pool as possible? Do you really need to request qualifications for that particular job? It's just going back, obviously, some of you will have departments that have done a lot of work in this, but others perhaps need to just look at around how do we take that next step on our EDI journey? Assess whether you can source things more locally. Uh, that will also improve your journey to net zero because uh, it will reduce your scope three emissions. It's not something we particularly talk about, local suppliers, but it is something that obviously uh, is talked about a lot nationally. Uh, councils uh, really obviously want to see people sourcing things locally. What else could we do there? And set targets in each of the 10 areas of the Good Business Charter and report on them annually. Why not publicize it on your website too? So this is what we're committed to. These are the targets for the year ahead. And it just really will bring the full benefits of behaving responsibly to your organization because everyone will know about it. You'll get a reputation of being a responsible business, therefore a great place to work. Uh, you'll, get a response, you'll get a reputation with customers and suppliers as well. who will be like, yeah, this business is great. They pay us promptly. Not something that happens for everyone. So. 
you know, there's a real benefit to just shouting out about what you do. A lot of good businesses aren't very good at this because they're just like, well, we don't want to blow our own trumpet. But actually, you know, this is why we provide a framework which enables you to do that in a really effective way. So the benefits of true embedding, as I've said, it's a clear way to communicate internally your commitment to people and planet, and that'll improve staff retention, help you recruit the best talent. It's that credible third party signpost to consumers and other stakeholders as more and more people look for evidence of this. It's an effective strategy for good growth, because if you commit time to addressing these components and really work to improve your approach, it will have a knock on effect on your productivity, your competitive edge, your sustainability. And it pushes you to keep striving to be even better in your response to business. And as a result, it also positions you, I believe, well ahead of competitors as clearly committed to these principles. Everyone's kind of trying to play catch up. If, if some organisation like, oh, look, we're now doing this, you're like, yeah, yeah, we've been committed to this for the last three years. You know, this is something that is already so embedded in our business. It is how we operate. So it really enables you to be ahead of the curve. So I think that's enough from me. It's a little bit of an overview, some ideas. It was nice to see some people writing notes there. I think it just hopes to give you a bit of a flavour of what we mean by really pushing it all the way through the organisation. But as I said, I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers who can say how they've done it in their own particular situation. So first of all, I am going to welcome Natalie, who works for Schroeder's Personal Wealth. I'll let Natalie explain what Schroeder's Personal Wealth does and how she and their organisation has embedded the GBC. Over to you, Natalie. Hi, Jenny, and, and welcome everybody to this call. Um, yeah, so we are just about to um, embark on our process for reaccreditation. It will be our third year, so um, yeah, great time for us and great timing. So um, my role in Schroeder's Personal Wealth is it's quite broad strategically. So I, I kind of look after colleague wellbeing, our um, DE and I strategy, and all the things that are run alongside that. And I'm a, through those, I'm a member of our Responsible Business Network Committee. Um, I think. You know the purpose and the reason why I said I'd, I'd love to speak today is you know why we felt it was important to embed and explain why we became a member of the Good Business Charter into our colleagues' understanding, making it a great place to work, but also for our frontline colleagues so they can discuss with pride when talking to clients. So our business is is wealth management. We are a joint venture between Lloyds Banking Group and Schroders, the investment management company, which many people will have heard of. Our, our mission and our purpose is to, to bring advice to more people so we can change lives. We firmly believe that everybody should have a plan. And um, we want to dispel the myths that you need to be you know, greatly wealthy to have financial advice. So the kind of the, the, the value and, and the framework of the foundation of the um, Good Business Charter enabled us to kind of start to embed that in our responsible business approach and to be able to evidence and communicate to all our stakeholders. And the value of bringing colleagues along the journey and being part of it, you know, feeling informed and involved really raised the engagement and commitment and enabled colleagues to be able to kind of bring to life for our clients and help us to fulfill our mission. Um, so we change lives is, is kind of one of our values and purpose, as is we are responsible, you know, a key part of our belief, goals and purpose. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of how, how we embedded. Um, so in, internally, initially, we focused on some basics, sharing the, the website, the Good Business Charter website, putting some of the, the, the stickers up in, in our offices. But a lot of our colleagues that work remotely, particularly the advisors who are uh, dealing with clients. And obviously through COVID as well and the, the fallout with that, we do operate a hybrid working approach. So we wanted to wanted our colleagues to explain, uh, to be able to explain and understand the charter. Um, we covered what it means and how prou proud we are to receive the accreditation, you know, made a big, a big deal about that. And, you know, we, we already had started a responsible business network meeting, but that gave us the impetus to kind of give that responsible business network a real framework as well. 
um, you know, and we use the, the leverage of that to get more colleagues to join the network. And we've got representatives in our responsible business network from all functions across all areas of our business. So we have around about 850 employees and we're solely UK based. Um, so it, initially it was a kind of a call to action to provide short update in the teams to be able to kind of filter that, that message and start the inquiry and ask the questions around, well, you know, what does the Good Business Charter do? What is it about? What will it, what will it help us to be as a business? So the logo, obviously, as I've already mentioned, you know, being displayed on our website when we issued our first responsible business report last year, we focused really heavily on the 10 components. Um, and with a follow up again, you could probably see a paper copy of it, although it is on it is on recycled paper um, that I've got here. Um, it's followed up again in, in this year's report, which we're really proud to see. Um, so since receiving our accreditation, we felt it was really important to maintain that regular rhythm of communications and initiatives to highlight the actions we're taking, you know, in line with the commitment. And those, particularly the component components of the Good Business Charter. So some so some examples really. We've, we've cascaded internally an interview that Jenny, you did with Joel Lipley, our uh, CFO, and who's the chair of our Responsible Business Network. He's also a chair of one of our other diversity networks too, which I'll, I'll cover a little bit about that later. Um, but that enabled to provide a bit more context for our colleagues to understand the charter and see the face of the Good Business Charter. And also seeing the fact that our senior leaders were really getting behind the commitments, um, I think helps us to kind of elevate and highlight how important it is. And having that visibility of our senior leaders, we have regular kind of roadshows, ask me anything, you know, so our, our, our senior leaders are accessible to anybody in the organisation. So whilst we already had an established responsible business network and we'd created some work streams, this enabled us to, to kind of really focus the work streams around the 10 Good Business Charter components and enabling that appropriate and defined action to, to really ensure we honed in and with purpose and, and be really meaningful in ensuring that we maintained and really further developed the commitment to each component. This, this then made it easier to chunk up actions into clear themes. And then we had some working groups, each owning a smaller number of elements. So again, that kind of cascade um, really worked. And the network took this one stage further by developing sub work streams to look at engagement activities to support that development and included um, identifying the communications approach, a timeline and the review process, none of which on their own are rocket science. But when you kind of look at them all together, kind of create that kind of fundamental process that we wanted to. And that outline, that framework, uh, you know, has really helped us to continue that momentum. So we, we really empower our colleagues at SPW, you know, even if you're kind of not part of the work stream, we're always looking out for people to get involved and to demonstrate awareness and understanding and really think outside the box. You know, we, we are an organisation where every single person has an idea or, or a view or a thought we want to hear, we want to hear about it. So one success story, just as an example, was the introduction of Rocket Books. Um, if you haven't heard of them, they are reusable notebooks. I have one here. They do this size and they do, you know, the, the A4 size as well. Um, so what, what we did, what we did there, we, we did some research into available options. A group of colleagues piloted them for six weeks. And then as a result of that, we got feedback and it was a resounding success. I think it was 86% of those colleagues who trialed adopting it in the day-to-day -day role said, yeah, I want to continue using it. And we rolled that out. So a further 600 rocket books and they were giving out, given out at one of our roadshows. We've had them branded. So a further update on that, we, 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 everyone's in, in an environment at the moment with cost of living and, and you know, the, the squeeze on our wallets. So any colleagues who isn't using them anymore or, or has kind of decided that they want they want to adopt a different approach, you know, a screen notebook or something, we're recycling them. So we've, we've got, you know, a, an opportunity for people to, to give them back in and recycle them to somebody else. So that's a further evidence of actually, if you're not using it, it's OK, speak up and we'll, and we'll recycle them again. So that, again, is, is reinforcing the value in it's not just having a, an opportunity to trial and, and embed something and tick boxes for continuing to maintain that momentum. Um, so further collaboration um, 
embedded through the components through our links to our colleague benefits. So a company called Further without the E. So um, all colleagues have been provided with a subscription to Further. Um, it, it, it's an app and we can upgrade at a small cost, but that encourages wider environmental awareness. So this year we're also linking into organized volunteering opportunities that align geographically as well. And one, one opportunity through Further from an environmental perspective is seagrass. So anybody who watches um, Country File on a Sunday will have seen seagrass a couple of weeks ago uh, in Scotland. We're, we're doing it in South Wales, but you know, you know, we want to do something back in the UK as well. Um, so we've got heavily involved in that. Um, so we're, we've built the principles, I would say, the Good Business Charter into supplier engagement practices too. We proudly share, personally proudly shared our membership with some of my suppliers in, in my immediate role. And through those introductions, I think two of those have signed up to the Good Business Charter. So it's about, you know, constantly talking about it in a way that's relevant to those suppliers, in a way that's relevant to our organisation. I think stories and news articles further serve to kind of evidence how we're developing our culture aligned to the 10 components and embedding and normalizing that kind of thinking and behavior. And so we, we refer back to when we touch base and remind colleagues of the Good Business Charter and, and the commitments to keep it alive and fresh in the minds. So some recent examples, for example, um, we have used, um, introduce e-signatures for client convenience, bringing to life the service, cost and environmental successes associated with that and we communicated that to all colleagues. So if a colleague isn't client facing, they may not have been aware of that. So we wanted everybody to be, to be aware. Uh, and that kind of engenders a continuous improvement mindset as well. Um, linking back to our volunteering partner, um, we've got a specific focus on community and environment and, and together with aligning those online opportunities too, uh, to awareness day. So recently we've had World Earth Day, uh, this Youth Skills Day and Recycle Week, enables that direct link and thinking outside the box. So a colleague may not want to give up a day out of the office to go and do what your traditional volunteering activities may be. Kind of thinking a little bit more broadly about doing it as a team and, and what are you recycling? Are you, are, you know, are you using your recycle bags at the supermarket? Have you got a, a reusable water bottle? All those sorts of things that people probably take for granted and don't think, actually, yeah, that's all a, a contribution to that bigger environmental area across, across what we're doing. Um, another way that's really helped us from a, from a colleague wellbeing perspective. So last year we launched um, to build employee voice and demonstrating our desire to really listen to our colleagues. We launched a listening wall, a platform through Harken. Um, it's, it's around listening to our colleagues in real time and not just at survey time. So it's given us that real live insight. And without going into too much detail, colleagues are invited to kind of score themselves on a daily or less frequently and put a comment. So it can be, um, it can be around the weather, it can be something that's bothering them. It's all anonymous. So nobody, um, nobody knows who anybody is. So the CEO, Mark Duckworth, will put comments on. And he can put his name on the end if he wants to. Also, if we've had, you know, some issues, you know, with what we want to reinforce or we want to improve some of our processes, we'll go out and, and, and ask people and people will comment honestly if something's bothering them. So that psychological safety and that willingness of our senior leaders, because, you know, it's quite a courageous thing to do to launch something like that in an organisation um, that everybody's anonymous. Um, we've got a great team of advocates. So again, it's about the power of our people and utilising that for the, a force for good, really, in, in sharing how, you know, ideas for improvements and how we're embedding our culture across the organisation. So we're all individually, I believe, individually and collectively responsible for the organisation we work for. Everyone knows that grand gestures and strategic direction on its own don't truly build a culture and belonging it's the things in between that do and it's the things like the you know rem remembering something that somebody's done and saying oh you know that that's a great example of one of the components of the good business charter or that's you know do you know about what the, and having a conversation and celebrating successes and, and acknowledging um what what colleagues have done um just a few more things um so responsible business town hall sessions across the business 
you know, it, it's a continuous flow. So then it might be something specific, but it all kind of links back. Um, we've got a team of sustainability champions across all of the UK. We've got a bit of a roadmap with those on. And we have created core work streams to build engagement. Um, so I've already talked about the Rocket Books, um, talked about other sustainable benefits of the Further app and the, the Seagrass. We've got a green car scheme, electric bikes, sustainable living products, um, and like subscription to you know the Action Group Further is, is, is kind of one example where we're, we're engaging colleagues. So we're, we're walking the talk basically across our organization. And that then enables our client facing colleagues to say with pride, okay, you know, we're not greenwashing, we're actually delivering what we say. And targets is a big thing. I know you mentioned targets, Jenny. So, you know, we have, you know, we are, um, we've been bought some purchase some credits, so we're, we're net zero, but we've made a commitment to actually not purchase credits in the future. I think by 2025, you know, we're on, we're on that journey. So we're looking strategically, you know, in terms of our internal policies, Flying's out the window, literally. Nobody can fly anymore. There'll be exceptions. There's always an exception, um, but it's got to go through Joel, our CFO. Um, you know, and you know, trains, car driving. Okay, do you need to go in the first place? Do we need all these people at a meeting? What other creative op opportunities can we have? Do we need as many meetings? All of those things are contributing to you know thinking outside the box and thinking creatively. You know, we are we are a client business. A lot of our clients want to see our advisors face to face. So particularly when you think about the demographic of our of our clients as well, we tend to generally be the, at the older end. We are really focusing on that intergenerational approach, and you know, looking at um, you know maybe a a creative approach to maybe a client face to face meeting and encouraging you know um, a hybrid approach to that relationship going forward. I mentioned, I, I touched on diversity. So all of our diversity networks um, have a regular steering committee meeting. I chair that, it's going to be, and I also chair one of our diversity um, networks as well. And the Responsible Business Network is an active member of that. So it's not just something that sits on its own. I think in some organisations, it might not sit naturally within that kind of wider employee resource group. We've made sure it fits, you know, and in terms of, um, any events and, and things that we do, we kind of look at it from the lens of all of those different intersectional approaches, which is really important for us to really ensure that we are an inclusive employer and people feel they've got a place um, across the whole organisation. Um, so just to kind of finish, really, we've, we've mapped our responsible journey into phases. So colleagues can engage along the way in, in various ways. So talked about the foundation and the responsible business reports and the networks. We're launching um, a responsible investment proposition as an organization. So there'll be client letters, website updates, and then progressing that proposition going forward through our standards about being, being responsible, about changing lives and, and colleagues and, and in terms of where we're going as an organization. And it's that commitment, I think, through that and then any new suppliers that come on board, you know, they're asked those questions around um, what is their focus around the 10 components, but in terms of, you know, being a good business themselves. So I think that is, you know, a further way of how we're continuing to commit to this. It's not just a tick box, yay, celebrate. It's, yeah, we're going through, we're going through accreditation again. Yeah, that's fine. It's a touch base, but we don't just do it once a year. It's a regular thing. So I think that kind of summarises and I'm, I'm open for any questions, but uh, that's it from me. Thanks, Jenny. Brilliant. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks for loads of really practical examples that we can all take away. And Fred as personal wealth have been absolutely amazing and really have helped teach us about how you really can embed this. Most of my notes begin with C, constantly talking about it in a way that's applicable to suppliers. Uh, celebrate with everyone, even though something like electronic signatures was only going to affect a certain part of the business. Celebrate with everyone and use it as an opportunity to draw back in that commitment to the Good Business Charter. Courageous leadership, collective responsibility, lots of C's. Uh, brilliant. We will um, pass over to Katie and then uh, if you do have any specific questions for Natalie, we'll bring them in after Katie has shared. So we happen to have two different speakers today, both from the same sector. 
I don't know how that why why it is that financial services sector seems to be doing a really good job on this, but it is the truth. Uh, so that's we wanted to have the ones that we knew were really embedding it, even though they have to be from the same sector. So I'm delighted to welcome Katie from Wilson Wright, uh, which is the Hey, thank you. And thank you, Natalie. That's brilliant. Um, so yes, both both from sort of financial sectors, but I do think a lot of the stuff that we'll be talking about is completely applicable to any industry at all. Um, so just a tiny bit about Wilson Wright. We have been going for 130 years, which is quite a long time. So there's quite a traditional foundation to the business. Um, but I'd say over the last five, 10 years, uh, the business has quite shifted quite substantially in terms of it's ambition, forward thinking, um, looking really progressively forward to the future. Um, we cover your traditional areas that any accountant would, but so accounting, tax um, and business services. But, but again, with this shift, it's really looking in that advisory piece. Um, to give you an idea then of the types of clients we work with, that is anyone from the bigger corporates. So we do our auditing for those. Um, we have a lot of people in entertainment, lots of different industries, and we support a lot of entrepreneurs, um, which is the introduction and how we were introduced to the Good Business Charter. So Julian Richer has been a client of ours for many, many years and has an extremely uh, long and strong relationship with our CEO, Adam. Um, and the two have worked so well together because I think there was always this shared value, shared beliefs in how to run a business. Um, so as a starting block, when we first started looking at the Good Business Charter, I think we were in a really strong position because quite naturally there was this link with what Julian had set up and his beliefs, um, obviously with the support of lots of people around him, um, and, and how the business had been run today. We also have that added benefit, which I'm sure Natalie would agree, um, you know, being a professional services um, employer, there's certain standards that we've always had to adhere to. Um, so we're in a strong position, also regulated by ICAW. So again, you know, things like fair pay, working hours, fair tax, they are things that, you know, they were absolutely given, fully, fully embedded. Um, so I joined as HR director about six, seven years ago. Uh, I was the first person to do anything HR related. Um, and the business has changed. And I think we have done many, many things. Um, and in fact, so many things that I think it got to the point where there was lots of things flying around. You know, we're doing brilliant stuff, getting fantastic feedback, doing bits of this, doing bits of that. And that was great. But I think what the Good Business Charter has given us is that real framework uh, to measure ourselves against, to make sure we're keeping ourselves accountable, to dig a bit deeper and use as that kind of benchmark. Um, so what I was going to do then is focus on three particular components that um, probably naturally do fall into my area. So in HR, uh, so we're looking at uh, EDI, employee representation, and employee well-being. Um, so EDI. So for many years, I think we've taken it for granted that we were a very diverse, very open, very unjudgmental workplace, and that was from you know walking the floor. So you could see we had, and actually it is literally fifty-fifty male-female ratio. Um, Again, you could see a clear mix of ethnic ethnic groups within the firm. And also, because it is an open workplace, you knew there was a high proportion of LGBTQ plus employees. So it all felt quite right. But what the Good Business Charter forced us to do was kind of evidence it and dig that much deeper. Um, so a few things that came out of that, we had a very standard equality policy. And actually, we realised that we really need to believe in this policy because policies are as Jenny mentioned at the beginning they can just sit on a shelf and be a policy um, so the way we made this more engaging we knew it would have a better chance of being embedded is it was led by one of our senior partners actually a senior partner who is very busy and is very difficult to get time with but he's also very very passionate about diversity and inclusion and so he championed this which so that automatically meant that it was going to have more of an impact um, so he developed the policy we launched it um, at one of our annual events, um, an annual event where we give the whole of the employees a kind of business overview of what's gone on. Um, and that was really that kind of top down, you know, this is what we believe in and this is how we're going to be, you know, embedding it. Um, another area we looked at was to look in, at our data in more detail. So it was a bit of guesswork before and we felt very happy and proud of that. Um, and out of the... Uh, more formal data analysis, 
uh, we did find that there was one particular ethnic group that was quite underrepresented um, at Wilson Wright. Um, and it was around the time there were a lot of webinars going on. I'm sure many of the people on the call attended them around diversity and inclusion. There was webinars every day around them. Um, and I would ask, you know, what do we do? I, I'm struggling to suddenly make our employee base diverse and, a, and specifically with a particular group. And so we looked actually industry wide and realized that that actually there was the issue. There were not people coming up and into the industry. Um, so that felt a little bit out of our control. So we looked at what was in our control and that was around creating and ensuring that the inclusive environment that we had and wanted to carry forward with the growth and new people coming on was really made as strong as possible. So um, to make sure that, that that was embedded properly, we looked at you know a traditional sort of code of conduct um, and it just didn't feel right for our type of business. Um, you know, the sort of checklist of this is what you should behave like and this is what you shouldn't behave like. Like, so we uh, developed what we call the working the right, so it was the right way, so very cheesy, but again, anything that's going to help it stick with employees, I think is going to help. Uh, so I worked with our employee forum group um, who represent all different areas of the business and we looked at what was important to people. So there was stuff around, you know, sort of the type of environment that we all are absolutely brought into. But what the main focus is, and this came out from those meetings, was that the, the idea of having a list of what you can and can't do to be a responsible business in this area. Um, so, for example, silly example, but, you know, is it appropriate that you give someone a hug and a kiss? Because that could be offensive and make somebody else feel excluded. And, you know, that might not be appropriate behaviour. But then you use an example of a long-standing client coming in who hasn't seen a partner for 20 years and you can't have a policy and make a statement if you're not going to follow through on that. So instead we focused on giving all of our employees a clear path to report, to go to, to seek advice, to have points of contact if there was ever any behaviour or anything going on in the business that they felt uncomfortable with or excluded from. And, you know, that's ranges from our partners who are very, very open door to a anonymous uh, email that people could just send messages to. Um, so there's a variety of different things that we try and promote so that people can reach out if they're feeling uncomfortable. Um, so that was that kind of we'd done the policy, the senior partner, the kind of top down, and then we did this bottom up. So that part came from the employees. So, again, when we rolled that out. Um, it was it was a very easy message because everybody knew about it already. The representatives from the different departments had done a great job in engaging everybody else. Um, we also make sure that we engage new joiners with this because obviously it's great to um, you know start an initiative with all the people that are currently there. But obviously, as we're growing and changing, it's important those new joiners are caught up in it. So. Before moving on to the employee representation, um, and it's because these two are really interlinked, and I think that's what's been really, really um, interesting from looking at the Good Business Charter is that they are all interlinked, and that employee representation and employee engagement with all areas is so important. So um, one of the things, and I'll touch on it later, is we've been working with an organisation called Inspire. Um, so they work with schools in and around central London that are based in deprived areas, and with children who are quite severely underprivileged. Um, and they try to open doors to careers and industries and opportunities that they just wouldn't know about without having access to this organization. Um, and me with my HR hat on at the beginning, thought, great, fantastic, we'll do some work with you. Where can we add the most value? And where might we benefit? Okay, we'll do some work experience. So that's your A-level sort of all 16 to 18 year olds coming in for a week. People have already decided they're interested in, in looking at finance and quite possibly accounting, um, and they can come in and spend the week. So rather than giving that opportunity to, say, client's son, who might have six other opportunities, actually it's going to somebody who would not be stepping foot inside an office if it wasn't for this, this organisation. Um, and, you know, we were very pleased with that. And actually somebody who's on our social committee, which is, again, something I've come on to, who manages that relationship with Inspire and leads on that, came to me and looked at all of their range of initiatives and told me about the Dragon's Den. And it is actually working with primary school children, which is something that I'd sort of not considered. Um, and the reason it was so interesting and then ties back into this ED&I is that I was told by them, and I'm rubbish at remembering statistics, 
but I was told that by the end of primary school, if a child has not been made aware of a particular um, occupation or career path, it effectively, in most cases, obviously there's exceptions, most cases they will have closed that off. It just will no longer seem to be an option. It is not on their radar. You've almost missed the boat. Um, so what Inspire do is they go in and spend a week with each school. And with the year sixes, they go into the school, they brief them on a Monday and they are put into teams and they have to come up with a product or a service that they feel has got, you know, investment opportunity. And they spend the week developing that. And then on the Thursday or Friday, they will come into our office. Um, so we have 60 kids trooping through the office and we supply them with dragons. <laughs> So a mixture of partners and then also some employees who actually are genuinely interested in this. Um, so we have our panel and the kids come in, they present, got the music on, the Dragon's Den music, and they've got their PowerPoints. They've all got a role. So they've got finance, marketing, salespeople, um, and it is absolutely amazing. And looking at the group of people, the kids that were in that room, if you look at where we are lacking in terms of that lack of that ethnic um, representation, that's where that was for the majority of kids. So that was just really interesting. And so it shows, you know, we really need to, these ideas and looking at other options really do come from our employees. Um, so on to that, I'm gonna rattle off all the millions of things we do in terms of getting feedback, but then what's really, really important at the end. Um, so we have our employee strategy forum meet once a quarter. So they're the people I worked on mainly with the, uh, the Right Way to Work initiative. Um, they represent different areas of the business. Our CEO sits on that. So again, it is direct to our CEOs here. Um, we also had a, have head of departments. So we're getting continual feedback for them. They're very open forums. They reach out, get feedback and bring that to us. And then there's very much discussion around them. We do annual surveys, which I'm sure many of you on the call do. Um, and that's where we actually capture our diversity data. Um, and then, you know, as you were saying earlier, Jenny, about really quick easy ways to, to to grasp how people are feeling microsoft forms we do a pulse survey every quarter with three questions you know are you happy in your job are you learning and developing do you have all the resources you need and if there's any no's what is it they can provide us with more detail um, we also do exit interviews and obviously new joiner interviews you know what's worked well and what's the feedback it's a lot of feedback and if we're not doing anything with it, A, people notice, and B, we're not going to improve. So what has been much um, clearer from doing, being more engaged with the, the business charter is tracking that feedback and ensuring that it's all actioned and how actionable it is. And our CEO holds us accountable to that. You know, he wants to know, so where are we? You know, if somebody's got an issue, we need to take it seriously and, and come up with a, a way to, to sort of focus on that. Um, we will be this year as well, uh, introducing a reverse mentoring um, initiative. So I will yeah, watch this space. We'll see how that goes. So the idea is obviously where more junior people in the organization mentor our most senior partners. So this then builds, uh, leads us on to the, the final area I was going to look at in terms of the components of the Good Business Charter, which is around employee well-being. And again, this crosses back into that employee representation. Um, I remember in COVID, I was chatting to one of my friends who works for a very large, large, large bank, and it's very stressed, lots going at work, and hundreds of emails a day, and 50% of them were an email about her well-being, and was she okay, and could she do this, and could she download this app, and just too much information, not focused in the right area. So we are, are all of our employee well-being is actually led by our social committee, so our social committee acts in a very similar way to a school governing body. So whereby we have a committee that work together, and I'll explain the areas they oversee, and then they are kind of linked to different areas within the business. So they are holding us to account, but also coming up with those ideas. And then we can do a lot of work in the, back, in the background. A, a big challenge sometimes of getting lots of employee engagement is that it can pull employees and hours, fee earners, away from their day-to-day -day work. So what we've done is we've they get involved in the ideas, give us their views, input, and then we can go away and we've got the support in place to then go and actually put these things in place. Um, so our social committee don't just look after social events. 
they do, but they also oversee our environmental focus. So we are net zero at the moment, but we obviously want to continue to improve and do more. There's a real appetite at Wilson Wright to do that. So the two link employees with that um, have regular meetings and give us updates. Um, CSR, as I've already mentioned, the main way we do, um, but the main thing that we are focusing on at the moment is Inspire. Um, and then obviously the well-being. So the well-being initiatives and any events we do, they will be, we will engage our employees as to what they want to see and what support they need. Um, again, just embedding this further. So we have each of those employees have done their mental health first aid training. Um, every single employee that we've sent on that, so Mental Health for England do uh, run these courses. The feedback has been amazing and not just this is amazing for my role at Wilson Wright and my ability to do my role in looking after the well-being of people here, but actually for my life and the skills that you can get out of that course, um, they all feel are just so transferable. So I'd really encourage people to get people mental health first aid trained. I'm sure many of you do. Um, all of our new joiners have mental health awareness training when they join. And obviously we run those events. We recently switched um, employee assistance providers, so EAP, our EAP programme, it just wasn't being used. And when I went through the process with an employee who needs some support, it wasn't working. Um, it just wasn't accessible enough. So we've recently shifted and not only are we going to be, obviously we've rolled that out, um, somebody else who's just joined the HR team needed some more help with all of this. Um, we'll actually be spending time almost individually going and sitting with people. Look, have you got this downloaded onto your phone? Have you got it on your PC? Here's the link. I'm just going to save it onto your toolbar to encourage people to use it. Because so many of these things and so many businesses, we spend so much money on these. They're just not used. And it's really it, it's frustrating. But it's it, I know it's time. Uh, it, it takes a lot of time to actually get people using them. Uh, we also then being a financial services organisation, financial well-being has been a very, very um, successful area we focused on. So we've done everything from sort of your basics, which lots of our more junior employees have enjoyed to sort of more savings and investments. And next month we are having some sessions where we've got some mortgage advisors coming in because obviously that's an area where I think people are either looking forward in their lives and getting very scared or currently at that stage where they're facing these things so again it's what's topical what's coming up and the last thing before I, I come to an end um, is probably the cheapest easiest and most engaging uh, sort of well-being initiative that uh, we've used and it crosses over and and does a lot of things other than just employee well-being was we first launched it in COVID it is our step challenge very basic um, whereby people are put into teams randomly so a you get a mix of people the we use an app that's a free app it's called stride kit which you can download um you put people in a team and the team captain is somebody from our social committee so again it's trying to give them that uh so people know who those people are to go to and for a period of about three weeks there's a step challenge and people love it and they're getting out they're going away from their desks they're crossing over with employees that they wouldn't usually it gets very very competitive um, I have to go and calm people down, uh, but it's a bit of fun as well. And, you know, it does get serious at work and definitely, you know, when times are tough and it just it does a lot of things. So it's a really easy thing and doesn't cost anything other than the time to set it up. Um, so, yes. Um, just before finishing, the final point, and I, you know, I don't want this to come across as um, cynical or anything, but but being part of the Good Business Charter, really, I don't know about all the industries that you guys are working in. But in professional services, we are struggling in terms of attracting and attracting the right people. And what it has enabled us to do is give a really clear way of communicating what we're about to people. And so we're finding that we can um, explain it to potential candidates clearer and we can find the right candidates for us because they're the sorts of things that they'll find important. So I think that's where I'd, yeah, a, a big thanks to it. It's given us a lot more structure. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more with them moving forward. Brilliant, thank you ever so much, Katie. That was great, a real range of ideas and um, really interesting. My career started in uh, an accountancy firm, so I'm just reflecting on how it would have been different if I'd had some other things in place that you have in place. So that would uh, that is great to hear. And, and just things like the work in primary schools, just fantastic. 
because I think some of these issues are deep rooted issues and they need innovative answers really and I think it's great to hear that people in year six start to think about a career in accountancy so really great thank you for all those examples we have actually only got seven minutes for any questions but I'm actually hopeful that you, in that you had a bit of a download of different ideas uh, just to kind of think oh I'll explore that one a bit more oh I really need to think about that and and then particularly what both Natalie and Katie have brought across is that it's a really useful framework to have brought together all these great things they're already doing and just kind of bring them together in a way that's really great to communicate and what I love when I talked to Katie before we prepared for this was just that that last point that she made that actually they are seeing it as something that helps them recruit great talent and people who care about this kind of stuff which more and more young people who are coming up through the workforce do so it's a great way to show that so enough of me waffling uh, if you have a question could you either pop it in the chat or raise your hand and I will uh, bring you in either for Natalie or for Katie or for myself or a comment if you have no questions um, Right, so Lindsay, that'll be to me. How long does the charter last for, please? So you have credit for a year and then you have to renew. So when Lindsay, when Lindsay, when Natalie said she was coming up for uh, renewal, that means that we, we basically ask you to recommit to the 10 and tell us what you've been doing over the year. We've really realised that it's important that we can evidence that businesses and organisations from other sectors are moving forwards. They haven't just tick the boxes and a year later like oh yeah that um, so we have now we're pulling out that information so so the accreditation lasts for a year uh, for those who are new it is entirely free for the first year at the moment and then it is um, a pound per employee so if you've got 500 employees it would be 500 pounds a year uh, capped up to half thousand Natalie raise your hands I just want to say as well um, that you have enhanced the questions and the process this year you've asked extra things which Julie, I know, gave us the heads up that they were coming, but those have been really helpful when going out. We do it on a like a gap analysis basis um, and make sure we kind of get the gather the evidence. It's been they've been really helpful in, for example, the employer representation question and you know adding that extra value and evidence and keeping people engaged. It's not just a tick box exercise. So I just wanted to mention that you're constantly refreshing what that process looks like. Brilliant, thank you. We very much, so Judy and Richard wanted to make sure that it was simple and accessible. And, and so I've been sort of saying, yes, we want to keep it accessible, easy language, not taking hours and hours of people's time to complete. But what we've done is like, yeah, but it needs strengthening. We need to make sure that our businesses and, and uh, all our organisations are really, they understand it because sometimes they might think they do. And then we have a conversation with them mid-year and they don't really know what diversity and inclusion really looks like. So, so we're trying to get that balance. That's really helpful feedback. Thanks, Natalie. And for those who haven't got to renewal yet, don't panic. It's not like 300 questions. It's just like gives a bit of information of how you're ensuring employee well-being. How are you making sure that employees' voice gets up to the to the top level? So, um, so yeah, that's, that's coming your way. Um, any other questions? No questions. Really good ideas. We can take away. That's brilliant to hear, Richard. Um, right, I'm going to, we will make this available. I'm also going to do a blog. Just, you know, we really want to infuse people and, and get them to think about all these different ideas. And, and, and I hope you would agree that although both Natalie and Katie are coming from the financial services sector, actually, we're just talking about people. We're talking about people in, uh, in that business, we're talking about uh, the environment, talking about things that, that are transferable from one sector to another. 